All right, great. Um, thanks for having me here today. Um, I work with, I'm an architect with Malum, um, based in Seattle. We also have a, a firm or an office down here in Portland. Um, the project I'm gonna spend the most time talking about is uh, the Richard Woodcock Center for Education. It's in Western Oregon University. Uh, I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about that. It's all, it's kind of finishing up construction now, so I wanna share a lot of the lessons learned we've gone through. Um, and when Craig first uh, approached me to give this talk, he really wanted it to be about um, Malum's kind of investigation work in mass timber. So I'm gonna start out with just some of the other uh, investigations we've done before this project. Um, and if, in a few kind of introductory slides, I, I don't know that I even need these anymore, but I think the, the image on the right just kind of speaks for itself about what CLT is and the potential it has and how it can really change and revolutionize the way we think about buildings and certainly the way we think about wood buildings. And then the, the large size of these elements also changing the way we think about it, the fabrication of the elements is changing the way we think about building and also the way we think about on-site construction. Um, and then something that hasn't really, I haven't really heard talked about, uh, Kate Simonen from the University of Washington talked a little bit about the carbon issues with wood and how it's, um, generally speaking, a, a better carbon balance, but there's also the health profile issue, um, which I think as architects, um, looking at the health uh, and welfare of, our, of the occupants of the building, and if you look at this, this is information from the Quartz database, which shows that CLT is actually uh, over 99% timber and about 1% resin. And so here's this material that's over 99% natural. Um, you don't actually have to do much but mill it down the size. And with only 1% additive, I think it's uh, pretty much the best material we, we have. It's, if you're looking at its competitors like steel and concrete, and the different uh, additives that go into that, and a lot of them are actually not good for our health at all. So as we're looking at which materials to choose, I think that actually is gonna play a large role. Um, just really briefly, a few years ago, uh, Malum, in uh, collaboration with, with Walsh Construction and Coghlan Porter Lundeen uh, engineers, we, we took this building on the left, which is a, it was a recently completed project of ours. It was a uh, five over two, seven story, um, a student housing project at the University of Washington. We were limited to 75 feet because of the construction type, but the area was zoned to 105 feet. So we said, hey, what if we had actually filled out this building to the full zoning height, maximized its uh, density potential, um, and built it in CLT, what, what would that mean? So we went through this study and developed assemblies for a uh, CLT building um, at 10 stories, a concrete building and a steel building and uh, went through all the assemblies, looked at ways to lay out the building, um, and then did a cost estimate on it. And the, the data is a few years old now, it, but we found that it was about 4% less expensive to use CLT than concrete. Um, I think this is a study we wanna dust off uh, sometime soon and reinvestigate it because um, I, would, I would wager that it might even be uh, uh, better than 4% at this point. And so some of these investigations, along with some assistance from uh, the Seattle chapter of the American Institute of Architects and some traveling and independent research, uh, led me to put together this book that came out last year, which is uh, the first book that really just focuses on mass timber construction and trying to take the lessons learned from that into an actual built project. And um, obviously we know that Talking to other architects and engineers is really important, but doing the project yourself is gonna, uh, you're gonna come to new stones to overturn and new challenges. And so this was Malum's very first project with cross-laminated timber. Um, I think this building is actually a great one in the order of the speakers today as well, because it's not a full mass timber building solution. It was a project that, um, like many of the projects you might encounter had some, uh, had a tight budget, so we weren't able to use CLT for every, every piece of the building, but still able to leverage CLT for its aesthetic and structural purposes where we could and really get our feet wet in the use of CLT. So I think it's a great example of uh, trying to fit in this innovative building product where we could 
Um, so being a campus building, its form really relates to the surrounding campus environment. Um, these are just some, some quick facts about the building. Um, it's a two-story tall building. Uh, because of its occupancy, we could go type 5D construction, which is really the least restrictive uh, building construction type. So we could really do a lot with this particular project. And the code issues were not really a problem at all. It was um, our authority having jurisdiction was the city of Monmouth. And we didn't actually, it was, it was a pretty smooth code uh, permit process. But when we first started design, this is a really interesting project from the UK, uh, the Woodland Trust by FCB Studios. Um, and you know, this was the type of building we were thinking about, well, if we wanna do a wood building, let's make the whole thing CLT. And I guess I should back up for a second. Uh, the, the Richard Woodcock School Center for Education was one of two buildings that the prior governor of Oregon had highlighted to be a showcase for innovative use of wood. So right from the start of the project, we knew we had to use wood and we had to do something in, with wood in an innovative way. And so uh, it was kind of a no-brainer to say, hey, CLT is pretty innovative. Maybe we want to use that on this project. And so that's why we started looking at these precedents and saying, hey, could, could CLT be a full structural solution for us? And then some of these other precedent images, um, we weren't able to use CLT as the full structure, but we were able to kind of capture some of these precedent images of uh, having a, a really exposed interior of timber, um, something that you really experience uh, the timber when you're in the building. And so because the, the project had a, a, a tight budget, we, and we had to use wood products, or we really wanted to use wood products and push it as far as we possibly could, um, the building is actually kind of a case study in how many different types of wood products you could use. So there is some mass timber elements, but we have, um, what glue lamb beams, eye joists, CLT load bearing floors, CLT load bearing walls, uh, lock deck uh, floors, solid timber uh, posts, prefabricated panelized light uh, wood stud framing and plywood, uh, open web wood uh, trusses, and then roof trusses. So they were made out of wood as well. So really pretty much using wood everywhere we possibly could. Here's just the, the first floor building plan you can see Roughly on the north side is all offices, on the south side are the learning areas. And then uh, on either side of the building, on the far east and west, are, are really the areas that we wanted to highlight the use of wood. So because we knew we couldn't use CLT everywhere, um, on the east and west side is, is what we call our collaboration hubs, and these are the most public areas of the building where the students come together and meet and talk, um, the most visible areas of the building. And so we said, if we can expose wood somewhere and really uh, use CLT, this, this would be the best spot to do it because this is the most public area of the building. And we were really fortunate that our client, uh, Western Oregon University, was also really intrigued with the use of CLT and shared our enthusiasm that, um, that we didn't want to bury the CLT behind a gypsum board or behind walls, that if we were going to use it, uh, get as much uh, duty out of it as we could using it for both structure and finish. And then we have some two-story walls, which I'll show a picture of that actually go from the ground floor up to the second floor. Um, and so looking at the building, there's, there's not a lot of CLT in the project. Um, but I think it's a good example of how you can use CLT in very uh, limited ways, very specific ways, and get it into the project so it doesn't need to be a full building solution. Uh, the majority of the walls are plywood shear walls, and you can see the CLT areas there in green. Uh, the floor, we have all these uh, different floor types and you can see the area of the CLT floor is fairly limited as well. Um, and this was a rendering that we did looking at the interior um, of one of these collaboration hubs and kind of what we termed a, a wood jewel box, really the, the uh, prize area and the project, the place you really come in and feel the wood and the timber. And this was a uh, photograph during construction that was taken uh, several months ago now. So you can see the CLT walls. Uh, that's going to be a fireplace. Uh, is the opening there in the CLT wall. And you can see some of the open web wood trusses. This is a picture from only a couple weeks ago. So they've installed the windows. Um, you can still see the exposed CLT. 
Um, this is one of the other elements we use, lock deck, which is kind of a TNG uh, solid wood. Um, and this is a space, uh, our multi-purpose classroom, which was a column-free area that had these beams spanning about 33 feet, so pretty long span beams. Um, and here the ceiling is exposed. And we actually explored the use of CLT in this space um, for quite a while. It seemed like the right thing to do, but when we were comparing costs, uh, it was the lock deck was about half the price of CLT. And so that, that drove the decision, but when we start to look at some of the issues involving lock deck, this is just a diagram showing what it is, uh, where each of these TNG boards are individually nailed. Um, and being that it's dimensional lumber, it can move in direction in four different axes, which CLT will only move in two directions. So um, it actually could become a concern uh, with moisture in our wet climate as it takes on rain and its ability to move. Plus, it, it does depend on quality craftsmanship and takes longer to install. So you can imagine installing this versus a 40 foot by 10 foot CLT panel. Um, so I think in terms of when you're looking at risk during construction, I would say that CLT is a, is a lower risk product, um, but you have to pay a, a premium for that. Our contractor, Anderson Construction, had a, a really great idea during construction uh, where they decided to panelize the roof uh, trusses, um, and that really saved time and then eliminated some of the potential danger of flipping the trusses uh, over on site. And so that was kind of an innovative thing that came up on the fly during construction. Our engineers, Equilibrium, uh, based here in Portland, they were also the engineers for the Portland Zoo, and so they had experience with CLT, and they knew as well as we did that um, you really need to document all your CLT panels very well because there can't be any field modification. So these are just looking at some of the elevations that we did for all of our CLT panels. Um, this is the delivery coming in. And so this is actually D.R. Johnson's first, uh, first load of CLT for a building product. So this, is, uh, this project is actually the first uh, building to use U.S. manufactured CLT. So that, that's exciting. Um, it was exciting for us to use a new product. Um, but there's a lot of firsts on this project. So that obviously leads to some, some things that I'll talk about, some lessons learned. Um, one of the things you can see here is they, they wrap the panels in a, a white bisqueen, something similar to what would be wrapped in a glue lamb beam. And to place the panels, um, some of the uh, bisqueen was removed so that you could fit it into place. And I'm not sure, um, I think that that wrap was more of a material protection during transportation rather than really meant for weather protection. So I, I think that that's something to discuss with your material manufacturer. Um, during uh, your building coordination to see what kind of product they're going to wrap it in and what the intent is. This was actually used for some weather protection on site, but some, in some cases the panels got wet um, before it was reinstalled, so having a breathable membrane might be really important or, or really discuss what that product is and what its intended use is on, on, for the, uh, on the construction site. Uh, this is our base detail. Um, this, you can see um, on the lower left, it's a WT angle that's fastened directly to the uh, foundation. And then the CLT has a kerf cut at the bottom, so it fits uh, directly onto that steel section. And uh, interestingly, you no notice that there's no actual connection between the CLT back to the steel WT section. So that CLT panel can actually move. And we did that because we needed to decouple the CLT completely from the plywood shear walls. So the CLT panels aren't actually taking any lateral load at all. They're just taking gravity load. And so we, we came to that decision. It's obviously not what we wanted to do, but we were using the CLT handbook and the uh, seismic response coefficient or seismic response modification factor of an R2 for CLT versus an R6.5 for plywood shear walls. Um, and so if we were to tie in the CLT walls, it would have dropped the R value down to an R2 for the entire building. And that was going to lead to some complications in the design process. Um, so that's why we decided to decouple the two. Um, I think as an early project, 
this is something we just had to do in order to utilize the, the material, but I don't imagine that um, future projects, hopefully we'll be able to do this differently with all the testing that's happening. And here, just back to this diagram, uh, one of the other issues was uh, if the CLT had been connected, um, we think that it would have taken a disproportionate amount of forces because it's so stiff. Um, it, but, but talking to um, our engineer and to Woodworks, I, I think that the whole entire building, if we had gone an entire building of CLT, we could have used an R factor of two and been able to complete the project. But because uh, because of our budget, that was uh, an issue that we never really explored. So another uh, construction issue is uh, the really interesting thing about CLT panels, if you want to have them exposed, is you really have to take a lot of care during construction. Um, here you can see the contractor uh, getting uh, the panel perfectly into place, and you can see the hammer sitting there. And so that's um, great that they didn't use the hammer because you definitely don't want to do that to the exposed face of your CLT. And so it's, it's definitely a different way of thinking about construction and a, a different way that, um, that the people building the building have to know that this isn't a, a light frame wall that you can just kind of hammer it in place to get it plumb. And, and it is different and to have those conversations about that. Here you can see um, some of our CLT panels were notched at the factory. Um, and this was before D.R. Johnson had their CNC machine, so even um, with the cutting facility they had, all the pieces came together great. I should also say that all the CLT panels from D.R. Johnson were pretty much perfectly sized. Um, and during the erection process, I think there was a lot of uh, maybe butterflies in the stomach, but the, the erection process went pretty much smooth, and there, there was no major problem. So even with the kind of nervousness involved and doing something for the first time, I think after it was done, you know, it's kind of seen as, hey, this is a great way of building. Um, we did end up with a couple of unique details. Um, you can see there on the lower left where we actually have a plywood shear wall directly behind our CLT wall, um, and that's because we had to decouple the two. Um, we needed that shear wall there, so this is another uh, aspect where this is not something that we would choose to do, but because of the kind of early state of CLT and the understanding of its seismic response that um, to get the project done in a fast and efficient manner, this is the approach that we took. Um, here you can see again that CLT wall um, directly below the beams, uh, that CLT panel is kind of acting like two columns on either side of the opening, and then the, the CLT floor and glue land beams um, because all of, all of our CLT walls were only exposed on one side, we were able to use this very simple plywood spline connection. Um, and one of the other cost-saving methods was to use um, uh, Simpson fasteners uh, rather than imported fasteners. And here's an evaluation report of those fasteners. None of, they weren't taking any lateral load, so um, we, we probably had it pretty easy on our fastener selection because of that. Uh, a few more construction shots, as I was saying, some of the walls go two stories, and I think just looking at the sheer mass of these walls and, and uh, the size, I, I, I think it's a beautiful thing looking at it. And so we're pretty happy with the CLT and how it's turning out um, in these spaces. Um, so keep this image in mind as, as we go to a little diagram of, of what that wall is gonna look like. It's actually gonna support the main stair in the project. And here that stair is actually being supported off the CLT. Uh, one side of the stair is open. Here you can see some of the connection details. Uh, the CLT stair, it has a steel stringer and a uh, fastener is going through the steel stringer back to the CLT wall. And so uh, I think that's another kind of interesting aspect where that CLT wall is a beautiful interior finish, but it's also supporting the main stair, so it's doing double duty. Um, so everywhere we use CLT, we tried to make use of its structural capacity as much as we could. Uh, on the opposite side of the building, the CLT is also supporting the second stair in the project. Um, and this, this case is a little bit simpler of a uh, arrangement in that uh, two CLT walls are supporting this wood frame stair. So this one is a little bit easier to execute. Uh, just a few details looking at that. Uh, being that 
we're uh, kind of wrapping up on construction. The interior finishes are going in right now. So I did want to talk about a few of the challenges we had. Um, you know, I showed that picture of the installation process, and it was a cloudless blue sky day. And it was like, man, this is perfect. This weather is probably just going to keep going on forever. But then <clears throat> we ended up having the wettest winter uh, on record during the installation of this particular project. And so here you can see some of the unprotected CLT panels and unprotected lock deck um, during the installation process. So um, I think being in the Pacific Northwest, we have to accept that things, it's going to rain and things are going to get wet and to have that conversation and figure out a great strategy for how to mitigate the risk of that. Um, you can also see the CLT panels, um, the, the vertical panels. Uh, there was moisture on the slab, so there was also potential for uh, wicking of moisture up the CLT panel as it's sitting in a pool of water, basically. And so I didn't really want to share this image, but we had one area where we did see some cracking of the CLT panel, um, and then some other, uh, this glue lamp beam where we had some moisture issues there as well. I, I mean, that's pretty typical. Uh, we just sanded it down, or um, maybe we can use a uh, uh, kind of a, a wash to get rid of the, any staining that's there. And I would say that um, as, as we're looking at these mass timber buildings, I think the dry out phase, I know um, Thomas Robinson was, was talking about this a little bit earlier about uh, how you dry these projects out, and it's a little bit different than a light frame building. Um, so it, it seems like it's something that you need to dry out on a, a little bit of a slower pace and don't blast it with heat and try and dry it out as fast as possible. So I think these are also really important issues to have um, with your contractor and look at your specifications and decide. Uh, so if, if the building does get wet, how you're going to dry it out in a way that doesn't damage any of the interior finishes of these uh, mass timber panels. This is just a diagram looking at how water might start to move through and kind of your critical points, these joints between your CLT horizontal panels or uh, the end grain at the bottom of a vertical CLT panel. And just, just recognizing those issues and going through the design process, recognizing them and, and, and coming up with a meaningful way how you address those. Um, I think it also means that different, at different points in the CLT panel, you might have different moisture content and how you deal with that during the drying out phase. Um, I'll get to a couple examples here in a second, but just conceptually thinking through this, what you do, um, you could either cover the entire floor with a membrane, use some kind of self-adhered membrane just at the joint, uh, perhaps liquid flashing. Um, I'm not proposing what, a, what the right solution is or what solution is going to work for your project, but I just want to bring it up as uh, points to discuss during the uh, construction process and the design process. And then uh, certainly sealing the end grain might be a possibility for the vertical panels or lifting them up off the ground. Um, so just different points for that impact both design and construction. So these are a couple of projects that I saw while I was uh, touring around Europe. This is an eight-story project um, in Munich. I got to uh, ride in the car with the architect, Arthur Shankula, as we cruised out to the site. Um, and he was saying that all of his projects generally start construction in the spring and there's really heavy rain. So you can see the methodology here. This was a CLT floor and they just uh, installed a membrane completely over the entire floor as one particular strategy. I know there's probably a lot of thought that went into why, why that made sense for this particular project. Um, and then there's a separate project that I visited in England. It's the City Academy. Um, so you can see that the CLT floor panels are just have a uh, tape at the, at the joints, so maybe a, a little bit simpler of a process, and you can see a little bit of standing water uh, on the CLT panels, which is less of a concern than if it gets in the joints. Um, so I'm definitely no expert on these, but I just want to raise the issue. And so when, when you're doing your first CLT project, that you can ask these questions as well. Um, I wish I had a, a finished image to share of this beautiful jewel box, but um, I think it is going to be a very beautiful space and really highlight the innovative use of wood. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk about sharing information, so this is my email address. And um, if there's anything that I can do to share my knowledge um, and answer any questions, please uh, shoot me an email or give me a call. Thank you.